could do them, but not comfortably. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, you can have a big meal and not feel it. Holiday season, beginning Holiday of December season. was a good time Anyways, to get this. Anyways, apparently a lot of people in my life knew about this material, and they did not tell me about it. If you are one of those people, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do not have not experienced this gene material before, do yourself a favor. Go, next time you need to buy a pair of jeans, go buy stretchy jean material and thank me later, okay? Sounds good, now you know. Yeah, you'll probably need stretchy material to, 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 for dancing. Oh, for dancing. Yeah. I wasn't sure where you were going with that. No, I would <laughs> never go anywhere I wouldn't sup supposed to go. Here in front of 400 of my closest friends, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, the weird thing though is sometimes people play sports in like full, full, like, they oh, wear, yeah. Yeah, not in, they're not changed for, for, for sports yeah. or anything like that. Those people are weird. And yet, you are actually all about to become one of them. So we have a little bit of a game plan that we are hoping you will play along with us today. That's right. Are there any people who are athletes in the room? Any people who maybe an, you're in an athletic program, you, you like, you're students. in varsity sports, or you played high school sports, anyone? We got a couple. Maybe they're not the morning people. We got okay. a couple here and there. Are there people who are like, sports is like the furthest thing that would describes who I am? Like if you threw me a beach ball, I would be like, the sun is coming at me. And it would just hit me and I would fall <laughs> over. This is me, guys. Okay. Well, good news and bad news for all of you. We're all going to be playing a sport today. We are. And, and what's the sport called? We have a, t we have a splash screen for this. The it's sport like... Mega, uh, super, ultra, ball. all the superlatives, like all the super, superlatives. ultra, mega. Because if you don't already think it's going to be great, it's you will because of the name. Super, mega, ultra ball. This all these superlatives. Playing. So, do you want to tell us about how I this do. game is going to work? I'll grab okay. the balls. Okay. So what we're going to do? The spotlights are very important here. So, we're going to divide the room right up this aisle down the middle, and so it's going to be the red half against the blue half. And so we've got two giant beach balls that Sam may have just warned you about. And the spotlights are going to highlight very specific parts of the audience. And your job as a red team and as a blue team is to get your beach ball to that spotlight. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's pretty simple. We know it's morning. We're still waking up for the non-morning people. As a as a warning, not all of the um, places in the audience are populated, so just know that. You may need to move around a little bit, but please be safe. Um, safety is no accident, and so... Safety is never safety, accident. Safety is never an accident. So By definition. Please be, <laughs> please be intentional. Um, watch out for the people around you. Um, so I think we had some of those sample spotlights just to give you an idea of what it could look like. Could we get those back up? So they're the white spotlights. There's, you can already see there's no people there. So blue team, you're going to have to think about that. This is just the practice round, so don't get too familiar with where these ones are. And then over there. So the beach ball can just get to anybody in that um, spotlight area. We good? We're going to do best of five. So you've got a couple chances to like figure this out and get it going. Uh, there are a couple rules, though. Oh. Safety is no accident. You said that first. I did. Uh, so don't hurt anyone in your attempt to go get this beach ball. Yeah. Uh, don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself. And watch out for the equipment that might be around you. Um, any other rules? There are good. no out of bounds, I think. There are no out of bounds. They could go to the wall. They could go to the back. But it is your side's responsibility to get the ball to the spotlight. Yes. And we will be keeping track. Best of five. I'm, I'm team red. I sort of even dressed appropriately. I didn't know that was happening. And I team have red. stretchy blue jeans. So, so you're ready to go. Yeah, there okay. we go. Wait, Are we? They, they did give me these ahead of time. Uh, these goggles came with the packages. Oh. Apparently, on the package, it says these are 3D goggles, which I feel like is a little bit of like a false marketing it's because these balls are 3D. So I don't know what's supposed to happen when you put these on. Well, like, maybe they're it? just regular goggles. You put them on, and you see everything as you should, and they, they market it this as 3D. This is also for a child. This is actually kind of disappointing. You were but like we'll put them on, and, and we'll... Uh, okay, well, you will put it on. I have to get mine ready. This makes things worse. My head is larger than this. <laughs> Did you think they're goggles? Did you think it would make it better? <laughs> <laughs> You're not swimming. <laughs> okay, let's play this I'm game. I'm a sucker Are for we good ready? marketing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got our balls ready to go. Um, and I think we've probably got our next spotlights ready to go. So on three, we will move Take the a spotlights. Look around. 
and then we're gonna start moving the balls, all right? Okay. Three, two, one, go! <laughs> oh, we missed it over there. We're not there yet. Is blue there yet? Red is there! Red team, red team! All right. Red sides got it. You guys can hang on to that in the spotlight. That is red now the, that's now the starting spot. That's the new starting spot. Red side, first point. All right, you guys ready go, for team. round two? Three, two, we one. We don't have the light. Go! We don't have the light. Oh, it's up here. Sorry, I'm helping. <gasps> oh. <laughs> I think we're at blue. Oh, oh. Blue's got it. Blue got it by like All half right. a second. One, one. One, one. We've got three more rounds to go. Neck and neck. Oh my goodness. All right. Round three. Three, two, one, go. Get it to Alicia. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> that was really fast. That was really fast. I don't I'm know what so blue side was doing. They're still blue batting sides that at the silly beach. ball around. They beat it to our side. They're They'll get it. They're still getting it there. Get it to the starting point. Are we there yet? We're good. Oh, oh, so close. Uh, you know what, though? They do have less people, so they have to That's true. That's spend true. greater effort. All right. And they've so got two more chances to catch up, because currently we're winning two to one. Two to one. All right. Round four. Three, two, one, go. Oh, oh, blue team did Blue's get it. Blue's got it. Blue's got it. <gasps> two, two. two, Oh my two. goodness, we're down to the final round. Guys, this is like winner takes all. The winner takes all. Okay. Best of five, first to three. It's tied two, two. Sudden death. All right, are you guys ready? Three, two, one, go. Where is it? Oh, 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 me, it's me. Right it's right up me. here. I knew that. <laughs> it's right up here, guys. Blue, we got this. Stretchy jeans, stretchy jeans. Stretchy jeans, stretchy jeans. <laughs> that was really close. I got really into that. Thanks for playing along with me. I, Red I team got it. You know what? Ultimately, I think it was the, the goggles that hurt us. Not me. I couldn't even get them going. <laughs> um, I, I lack depth perception, so sports are actually really stressful for when me. When they get bigger, they're coming at you. <laughs> yes, I understand. I understand the theory of it. Oh. It's, the, it's the execution that I. <laughs> In theory. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like I understand how these things work. But. So, uh, congratulations, Red Side. Yes. Give your hands around. Now, I think there's like a, a, a couple hundred of you on this side, and we wanted to reward you guys. Yes. But, but it is impractical to reward like 200 people. So most of you will just get the satisfaction of knowing that we won but one lucky person is about to get a prize. And, and we didn't want it just to be someone that we picked. We want it to be a representative of the people. We're a democracy here. A representative of the people. So this is what we're gonna do to find out who is gonna be the rep for this side, all right? When I count to three, all of you guys will start chanting a name. Your favorite name. Yeah, whatever name that comes to your It could be someone real or someone fake. Could be but you start own. chanting a name. Whatever name you hear most loud around you, I want you to stop chanting your name and start chanting that name. Yeah, it's going to be like a group vote. And then within 20 seconds, we will have one loud name being chanted, and we'll figure out who that is, okay? Blue team, as you start hearing like popular names arise, feel free to like join the, the, ba the bandwagon. All right. Are you guys ready? Three, two, one. I'm hearing Tom. I think it's Tim. Tom? Tim. 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 Can all the Tims on this side stand up? Do we have a Tim? Do we have a Tim? There are two Tims. Three Tims. Oh my goodness. Okay. All right. All right. We got to narrow it down. Yeah. Oh, we got four. Is that another four? Four Tims. One Tim's in the dark. Okay. What's our tiebreaker here? Uh, tiebreaker is we're going to start chanting a month. 
And then whoever, whichever Tim is closest to that month, their birthday, yeah, birthday. will be the representative of the people, the winner of the people. All right? So same thing, but birthday month. All right. Three, two, one, go. April, April, April. Anybody have a birthday in April? Look at that. Tim, is that born you? in April. No, I think Come there's on up. two. I think there's two. There's two in April. Are you all Oh, my April? goodness. This okay. has never happened before. Okay. Okay, so we're going to start. Too close the, to call. We're going to start in the middle. <laughs> we have one gift. Um, uh, who, April 15th. We're going to go up, down. 11. 11. What's your birthday? 12. 12. Oh. 12 calls it. The You're people like have spoken. Almost the same person. Okay, Tim, April born 12th, in April 12th. Come, Come on up. up. Let's grab a mic for a second. All right, so come on up. So, Tim, who's born on April 12th, what campus are you from? Uh, I'm actually in high school. You're actually in high school? Well, welcome here. Welcome. So fun. Did you come with your youth group or people? Uh, I came with my sister. Oh, fun. <laughs> Tim's sister. <laughs> well, chance her name after. What's your sister's name? Crowley. Yeah, when we, when we find her, wherever you are. Probably over there. Thank you. Yeah, Tim, congratulations on, on being the representative of the people. Yep. How does it feel? Uh, pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. We do have a gift just for you. This is a $15 Tim Hortons gift card. You could take your sister, or not. It's your card. You do what you want. Yeah. So thanks so much for playing, Tim. I'll shake your hand, too. <laughs> All right. Well, it was a really good start to the conference yesterday. Um, last night, we actually talked about uh, being made new in Christ. We had uh, Jen and Sunder. Uh, come and share with us what it means to be made new in Christ. What I found particularly challenging was, was thinking about how it's not just what we believe, but what functionally rules our heart that actually matters. So last night we talked about being made new in Christ. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what we're going to be talking about this morning? Yeah, this morning we're actually going to be moving into some really heavy stuff. Uh, normally this is like a day four of the conference sort of session, but this year it's on session two. Um, and so we are going to be talking uh, very directly about all kinds of things that might be very hard to hear um, and might be hard to think about. Um, so we're going to be talking about things like racism. We're going to be talking about things like sexual abuse, mental health, suicide. All of these things will come up very directly. Uh, through the course of this morning. And so we wanted to give you guys that heads up um, to prepare yourself and just know that it's coming. Yeah, these are heavy topics. <laughs> and, and we're sharing this with you. Uh, we thought it was important to talk about, not because, just because, but we think that as a community, it is important to think about these issues. These issues don't stop existing simply because we're playing a fun game. These is issues are real. They're, they're happening in our lives and maybe some of your lives and the people around us. And we want to think about how do we look at them through the lens of Jesus? What does it mean to think and process and journey together as a Christian community? And so that's what we want this morning to be about. We're going to start off the morning by having Eric uh, come up and share a poem with us. to run in hope ever nearer toward the God who went to you. Yet lift it we do, for it only seems right. Anger, envy, and lust, character and model of it, sloth, greed, and gluttony, domesticated, made small, like the underfed virtues we stretch tall. Pride, bending inward with self-love and self-hate, teaches fear. I myself, all rests on me inordinately. Yes, formally, we carry the weight of injustice committed, injustice omitted. 
Formerly, you were governed by fear, fear of loss, fear of death, fear of fire, fatal failure. Now, though the old burden is near, do not take them up again. The cords are cut, and the weight of weakness and failure of sin no longer binds the believer. Hey, Christian, you're a pilgrim. Take care where you step, but take courage also. Your brother, the king, walks with you. He invites you to throw off your burdens, continually laying the past down and taking up the hope of life, yoked with Christ. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? Come on, you guys can do the better than that. How's everyone, how's everyone doing this morning? <laughs> good, good. Let's all stand up and let's worship Jesus together. Um, there's space here in the front if you guys want to come and worship. Come on, don't be shy. Come in here. <laughs> space here and space in the front. Come forward, come forward. Bam. God is good, amen? Amen. And it says in his word that boldly we get to approach the throne of grace and mercy with confidence. And that is what we're doing together. Um, and we're going to sing these songs if you know it. Sing it as loud as possible. If you don't know it, still sing it as loud as possible. <laughs> All right, let's sing together. Oh, what a Savior Isn't he wonderful Sing hallelujah Christ is risen Bow down before Him, for He is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Let me hear you sing it out this morning, oh, a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. down before he for he is Lord of all sing hallelujah Christ is risen are you hurting broken overwhelmed by the weight of the sin, Jesus is called. Have you come to the end of the cell? Do you thirst for a tree from the well? Jesus is called. Every voice. Oh, come to. The altar, sing it The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born within the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. 
This song is about the process of becoming new. Here's what Jesus has to say about that. He says, No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the wineskins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No. New wine must be poured into new wineskins. Let's sing. In the crushing in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. Let's sing it again. In the crushing, in the pressing. You are making you wine in the soil. I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your perfect hand. Cause when I trust you, I don't need to hide. Jesus, bring new wine out of 
crushing in the crushing in the pressing you are making new wine in the soil I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear.
sing this in French. So for the first verse, we're gonna the first verse, we're gonna sing this in French. Just because we're reminded that we are able to worship freely in Christ in the language of our God. years things were really good and um, my parents were together and then they, they split up and after that um, I started making you know my I didn't have my father's guidance in my life anymore and it was I made started making poor decisions with uh, not attending school and the people I was hanging out with and what you know I wasn't I didn't have a good direction in my life anymore and um, and in that that void and emptiness I uh, I had friends that, you know, invited me to, to drink or to smoke, uh, you know, do drugs or whatever it may be that night. And, um, yeah, it got me to a place that um, I never expected 14-year-old Nathan to uh, ever be in. And by the time I was 17 or 18-year-old Nathan, I was a com totally different person. I'd never experienced depression before and I'd never experienced fear like that before, that um, just a hopeless wandering with no real sense of what I was supposed to be doing with my life. And I got to a place where um, a therapist said I had major depressive disorder and I couldn't even remember how it felt to, to feel joy with people and to um, feel excitement for what I was doing and a uh, passion for my life and um, that just continued a downward spiral into a um, place that I, I, I never hoped to be in. I remember I was getting my hair cut. I went to, to sit there and, and we were just talking about golf, just a, just a mundane thing and all of a sudden I just started crying and there, was, there were tears coming down my face. and. And I could, and it was the most awkward haircut I've ever got in my life, for sure. But I, I just, I'd had enough. I was, I was done with um, feeling terrible and um, just uh, not being happy. And um, so I, uh, I went to the hospital and um, and I admitted myself to Homewood. It's a mental health facility and I was there for three weeks and that was the hardest three weeks of my life, but it, it set me on a course correct. And I remember there was two things at Homewood that was like, everything was really hard there, but there was two times that I felt a freedom that I hadn't in a long time and I knew that I'd found something. And the one was a, a share group where we, I just went and I just talked and I didn't hold anything back and it felt amazing. And there was another one, there was, there was a, a little chapel there and a, I went to church when I was younger, but I felt God in an entirely different way that day. And I just felt hope again, and uh, I knew that I had found something and was on a, a better path now. 
I had, a, when I went to recovery, I thought I had a, the six month and done plan where I'm gonna get in there, do six months and I'm, I'm done. And um, after about, uh, it'll be eight years in a few weeks. Uh, it's, I've seen that that's not how it is, but um, the hope I found in, in, um, in facing big things and overcoming them and not staying stuck in um, depression or let's say, you know, like just thoughts of suicide and terrible things that I wish I never had to have in my mind. And that, uh, not having that has been, I never thought it'd be possible. When I was in that place and when you're in that place, it feels like this is how it's gonna be forever. And it's not. And uh, I just, um, I'm really thankful for that. I know that how people can suffer and I know how I had suffered and and I think that, you know, if you feel that way, no matter how intense your circumstances and no matter what you've done or haven't done or the shame or whatever it may be that's in your life, I think that there's a hope that can be found in Jesus. I just so encourage you to, to talk to someone and find help and to not, um, not, not end your life because just, <laughs> just don't do it because um, I've been there and uh, how I am today, I, I'm so grateful that I didn't end my life because the changes, the hope, the, the, the renewed spirit, the new me has been, I couldn't imagine not having those experiences in my life and, and I just can't stress enough from <laughs> my own experience that there is, there is hope in Jesus. There's, there's hope in others, and for me, I, I found that in my life, and that, that is my story, it has been, and I'm continuing to live that today, and, and my hope is that it's, it can be your story too. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce us to our first speaker this morning. Uh, this is Terry with me. Terry is a uh, prominent Christian thinker and leader in the indigenous community, and this morning he's going to be sharing with us faith and intersecting culture. Uh, Terry, our theme is new. Uh, do you want to tell us maybe if there's like a new TV show or a new podcast that you're listening to? Well, my wife and I are in the second season of Star Trek Discovery. We're, we're old Trekkie fans. Okay, that came out, what, last year? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and maybe, uh, maybe another one. Is there maybe a new person in your life that's made a big impact recently? Yeah, there's an Australian indigenous theologian um, that I met just uh, about a year and a half ago. His name's Gary. Wrote a, a book called Gondwana Theology that, that has really um, had a big influence in me. I, I actually had the privilege of doing the foreword uh, to that okay. book. So, do you have a twenty-second snapshot of that book? Well, uh, yeah, sure. He's just talking about the journey of Australian Indigenous peoples. Um, mm. So, as the narrative of uh, the biblical narrative of the Hebrew people unfolds, of course, there's a narrative for other peoples in the globe that's unfolding at the same time. So, he's talking about that and its intersection uh, with Christianity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Terry, I'm glad that you're going to be speaking this morning. I'd love to quickly pray for you before you begin. And I like that. Lord, I uh, thank you for uh, Terry. We thank you that you've uh, drawn him to yourself, that this morning we have the privilege and the and the opportunity to, to see how you shaped his life and how you're using his shaped life to now shape others' lives. So we pray that you would be with him. Uh, would you help us um, not be unmoved and unchanged as we hear about you at work? In your son's name we pray, amen. Hey. Thanks. Goye Pusul. Good morning. Good morning. 
So uh, I'm, I'm wearing my hat today. Uh, I was going to bring a headdress, but packing them on an airline is a little bit of a challenge. So I just brought my hat. And yesterday as I was coming here in the taxi, the taxi driver said, oh, is that a cowboy hat? I said, no, it's an Indian hat. Oh, tough crowd. <laughs> Since I'm an Indian. All right, slow to come up. It's, it's moving. It's a little bit of a wave. It's great to be here. I actually wore this uh, because some years ago when I spoke at uh, Urbana, uh, I, I took my headdress and uh, I was doing a number of things simultaneously and then speaking on the, on the New Year's Eve service. And uh, I had uh, my headdress set aside so that I could move from leading the communion service to putting on my headdress to doing my talk. And I had a young woman, very nice young lady, helping me out. And uh, so she took my package of notes, two sets of notes, one for the communion service so that I could lead it uh, properly, and another set for my talk in two different sizes of fonts so that these old eyes, as you can tell by the glasses, could actually see them. And she was quite nervous around me for some strange reason and around uh, helping me uh, get ready for my talk. Uh, and so she took the package, uh, the folder of my notes and my, and, my, um, and my glasses, and I put my headdress on, and I asked her to tell me whether there are two fingers of space above my eyebrows for my headdress, because when you have it on, it's probably difficult to tell. And she said, she nodded like this, and I said, oh, that's great. And so I took my notes from her as she handed them to me, and she dropped them just about the time they made contact with my hands and fell on the, on the platform behind the stage, and there were two sets of notes now mixed up, one for a communion service and one for my talk. And of course, she and I hastily reassembled them, and I looked at the first three pages, and they were the first three pages of my talk, so I thought I was okay. And I got out there, and the headdress was actually just at my eyebrows, so everybody couldn't see anything below my eyebrows. It was shading my... And the talk notes, I got the first three pages good, and then it went to the communion service. <laughs> so hopefully that won't happen today. Uh, I am the husband of one wife. Her name is Bev. Um, yeah, thank you. We've been, we've been, we just hit our 47th year in October. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, five and Bev was four when we got married. Um, <coughs> we have three wonderful children. Uh, we have twin daughters. They're mirror twins. If, does anybody know what mirror twins are? Yes, yes, okay. So they're, they're, when they look at one another, it's like they're looking at a mirror image of themselves. It's really quite fascinating. Um, uh, one of them teaches at the University of New Brunswick and the other is doing a PhD at U of A. And then we have a son, Matt. Uh, he's, uh, he's our baby, he's 38. Uh, yeah, he's a big baby. And uh, he lives and works in the Philippines with indigenous communities in the Philippines and Southeast Asia as well as uh, indigenous communities here in Canada. Uh, none of them are married. I have pictures. We could talk. We're into the traditions, beaver skins, some ponies, a few things. We could, we could have a good conversation after the session. If you'd like to, please approach me. What I want to do this morning is, um, in, the, in the hour and a half that I have, uh, is to, oh, don't be alarmed, <laughs> is to share a couple of stories with you and try and connect some dots for you. When I was a young boy, I was just oh, almost six years of age, my grandfather, father, and I traveled some distance from our community, our home community, um, to go fishing at a spot, you know, one of those spots known only to my grandfather. And having driven as far as the roads would take us in his old beater of a car, uh, we got out, we got our gear out, and we got ourselves ready to head into the woods and off to this fishing spot. And so we traveled into the woods some distance, and it was, it was a fairly dense uh, woods, fairly dense bush in the province of New Brunswick, where we uh, were going to go and do some fishing. And we hadn't gone very far, and I became very alarmed at the fact that the woods were closing in around us, as it seemed to me, and the 
trail behind and ahead was pretty indistinct. I couldn't tell where we were going or where we had come from. And so I tugged on my grandfather's arm furiously and expressed my angst to him that we were going to get lost. We wouldn't be able to find our way back. And he reassured me. Just leaned over his shoulder and gave me some reassuring words. And we traveled a little bit further. I'm sure to his mind it wasn't more than two paces. And uh, I expressed my angst again. We are going to get lost. This, this is really dark and thick woods. And how will we find our way home? And again, he just leaned over his shoulder, reassured me, and, and pressed on. Finally, on a third occasion that I had expressed my deep concern about getting lost, my grandfather put his gear down, turned around, knelt down, and then simply said these things to me. It's a lesson that has guided my thinking and actions from that day to this day. And he simply said that each new trail we take could seem like it leads along an uncertain path. The way back can seem unclear and obscured by the landscape. But he said, when you set out on a new trail, if you spend twice as much of your time looking over your shoulder at where you've come from as you do where you're going, if you fix the landmarks behind you firmly in your mind the way that they will appear to you when you turn around to tra take the trail home, you'll never get lost. You'll always be able to pick your way. So just imagine for a moment, you're traveling along some unknown road. And if all you do is focus on where you're going, when you turn to head back, things look a little different. What was once on the right is now on the left. And instead of leaning toward you, it's leaning away from you. These landmarks appear very, very different. And so he said, look at where you've come from as much as you do where you're going. In fact, perhaps more so, and you'll never get lost. That day, my grandfather gave me the ability to find my way to and from all of the various destinations in life that would lie before me, all of which, as I set out on each new trail, were initially quite unknown. Well, contemporary societies, young or old, are no longer used to looking at where they've come from. We're far more fixated on an as-yet-unknown and unknowable future, on what comes next. And rather than use the past to help us determine where we are on the trail and how we got here, we're more fixated on what will we do tomorrow and how will we do it. And we're more concerned about getting to some destination that we don't even know about yet or some point in time that we can't even predict yet than we are about living even in a good way in the present moment. And all of the mistakes of the present are things that we'll defer the consequences of to the future as a, as a result. As far back as 1973, Carl Menninger, very famous psychotherapist, quoting Daniel Burstyn's uh, PhD thesis, said, we've lost our traditional respect for the wisdom of ancestors and the culture of kindred nations. We haunt ourselves with the illusory ideal of some whole nation which has a deep and outspoken faith in its own values. The Christian church is like that. Christianity is like that. Our trajectories have been driven by some view of eschatology, some view of the future, some view of heaven, that we, we have no clue what it will look like. We have this idea of the Philadelphia cream cheese version of heaven. You familiar with that one, right? All the, all the young ladies here, you can look forward to Albert, <laughs> right? In the future, fluffy clouds, this white-robed hunk serving you for eternity, right? That's our view. There's some heaven in the future that we're going to, that we're moving towards, and that's all that matters. Let's get there. But the scriptures are pretty clear. No man, no woman knows the day nor the hour, not the Son, but the Father alone. The scripture's pretty clear. Why do you worry about tomorrow? Today has enough concerns of its own. What are you doing today? And the only way to know about today is to say, how did we get here? Now, in terms of indigenous folks, in terms of indigenous folks, and as I look out over the audience here, the vast majority will have come to this land in recent generations, the vast majority of you and your parents, which is a great thing, wonderful thing. So let me ask you a couple of questions. 
Put up your hand if you're a first or second generation, this is not an embarrassment thing, just, I just want to make a point. Put up your hand if you're a first or second generation immigrant. Keep your hands up. Keep your hand up if the land from which you immigrated was a land that it was one point colonized. Okay, lots of hands still up. Keep your hand up if the land from which you immigrated that was colonized was colonized by Europeans. Still there. Keep your hand up if the land from which you immigrated that was colonized by Europeans still has Europeans there and exercising governance and power. Europeans are still there in government. Now, with a few exceptions, there are no more hands up. See, the difference between those of you who had your hands up all the way through and me is that Europeans are still here and in power. The colonial experience is absolutely no different than in Africa or India or any other context that you can imagine European colonization to have taken place. And yet we haunt ourselves with this idea, as Borsten would talk about, this illusion that somehow this is Canada. That it rose ex nihilo from the landscape, unhindered and did no harm as it arose. It's interesting. As an indigenous person, last year when Canada was hitting 150, there was a fair trade coffee roastery in Nova Scotia called Just Us. The first fair trade roastery in Canada, in fact. And uh, for the first three days of the first week of this commemoration of 150 years of Canada, it had up Canada 150. And then Wednesday afternoon of that week, below it they put Mi'kma'ki. Mi'kma'ki is the name of my homeland, of the land of Mi'kmaq people. Put Mi'kma'ki, 13,000. Now stop and think about it for a minute. What's the picture of Canada that you have, and how did you arrive at it? What's the history behind you that if you look down the trail and look at the landmarks of how you arrived here that helps you understand Canada as it currently is? So last year as I was welcoming two Syrian refugee families at a conference, a Baptist conference, uh, I had my headdress on and I was dressed in a ribbon shirt. And we were welcoming two families, one Muslim and one Christian refugee family. And the conference had about a thousand participants in the, in the hall behind me. And so the Syrian families and their hosts and sponsors were on the platform. And myself and a Cree friend from Manitoba uh, and a uh, Nadliwa'en uh, woman from the west coast of BC uh, welcomed them. And so I turned my back to the audience. I said, I'm going to turn my back to you now and I'm going to welcome these people to this land. And so I turned my back and I welcomed these two families, including the young children, to the land by saying, we welcome people who come here for refuge. We welcome refugees to this land the same way that we welcomed all of the refugees that you see behind me. All of the audience. Because all of them had come here, or their ancestors, to find a place to live in peace, to find a measure of security, to find an opportunity to grow and to learn and to participate in a society that is not fraught with violence, although we have our share. That's what they'd come for, and they'd come as refugees. The myth of religious persecution is sort of the myth of arrival in the land. We came to escape religious persecution in Europe. Well, actually not. They came for economic purposes. It was still the same colonial experience. So that's, that's the chunk of Canadian history that you're probably not familiar with, and the experience of Canada you're probably not familiar with. But as an indigenous person, I still live as a ward of the state. I'm an old person. I, I was born when the crust on the surface of the earth was still hardening. And yet, I'm a, technically, under the Indian Act, still a ward of the state, still an incompetent person. Though I have a doctoral degree, I'm still not competent to govern my own affairs according to the Indian Act. See, these are things that you don't know because you haven't looked at where we've come from to get here. Laying down the past for me means laying it down in front of us 
so that we see clearly how we arrived at this point, so that we can understand well the errors and the triumphs of the past, so that we can then say, how do we move forward into the future in a good way, whatever that future might be? And it really is unknown and unknowable. Now, back in the early church, in Acts chapter, oh boy, time is fleeting. In Acts chapter 15, uh, it's one of those experiences that we need to look back to uh, as followers of the Jesus way. Acts 15, believers from the sect of the Pharisees came along and said, in order for you to be authentically saved, you must become like us. You men must receive circumcision and you must obey the laws and customs of Moses. And then you can be Christians. And the council of the church met. James, the first council member, spoke on behalf of the council after meeting and hearing the case put forward by Paul and Peter and Barnabas and others, including the believers of the sect of the Pharisees. And they said, it seemed good to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, these requirements that you refrain from meat, strangled, meat sacrificed to idols, from blood and from fornication. If you do this, you'll do well. Case closed, done. Now this was a conversation about what does it look like for us to be a follower of Jesus? What culture must we enter? What, what culture must we participate in? How must we express ourselves as followers of Jesus? That was what it was about. And they said, well, there's only a few things you need to worry about. You actually don't need to worry about whether you're Arminian or not, or whether you're a Calvinist or not, or whether you believe in the premillennial return of Jesus. Yeah, it, they actually didn't say anything about that. They didn't say anything about music, that you have to listen to Hillsong. Right? I mean, I, my version of heaven is not 24-7 prostrate before the throne singing Hillsong. Just, that's just not my picture of heaven. You don't have to have a particular preference in clothing. You don't have to cut your hair a particular way. You don't have to read a particular translation of the scriptures. If you really want the full authoritative word, you better learn Greek and Hebrew and a bit of Aramaic. So you don't have to be KJV or NKJV or NIV, the New Indian Version. <laughs> like, they didn't say anything about that stuff. Culturally, there is no singular Christian culture into which we must enter when we come to faith in Jesus. Like, it was really clear, folks. Acts 15 is really compelling. No single culture. Only four things. Refrain from meat strangled, sacrifice to idols, blood, and fornication. I suspect you don't care much about the first three. I hope there's some concern about the fourth. But you probably haven't concerned yourself with the first ones at all. See, that's how much culture is a concern for the Jerusalem Council. But for us, it's like, if you don't look like, talk like, walk like, think like, act like, dance, I mean, no dancing, I'm sorry. Um, Like me, then you can't be a real believer. If you don't sing the same songs, pray the same prayers, think the same way, look the same way, act the same way as me, you can't be a a full-on follower of Jesus. If you go... If you go into the pub and have a beer, you're not a full-on follower of Jesus. I mean, over the years, the things I learned is the difference between an Anglican and a Baptist. Anglicans will say hi to you in the liquor store. (laughs) You see what I'm saying? Like, do, do, do you see the foolishness of sometimes what we've created in the church? Well, this is what indigenous peoples suffered under. We were told, unless you look like, talk like, walk like, act like, think like Europeans, you can't be a follower of Jesus. More to that, we were told, unless you become like us, you're not really civilized. You're not really full human beings. We still do that to one another today. Not just Canadians to indigenous people. We we get that all the time. Now, admittedly, to some of you, I don't look very indigenous because I'm pigmentally challenged. <laughs> right? um, my, you know, my siblings and the rest of my family got this nice dark skin, like our, our, our brothers and sisters here, but I, I'm, I have a throwback 
Acadian genetics somehow. Because I'm a Mi'kmaq, but I have some Acadian French blood polluting, I mean, coursing through my veins. <laughs> See. But the moment people, moment people say, who are you? And I say, I'm a Mi'kmaq person, the tone changes. There's a different perspective. Because I don't look like, talk like, walk like, think like, act like them. And in the Christian church, I do theology. I'm a theologian. I was, I'm a trained theologian. Every degree I earned was from a Western institution, but when I talk about theology, they, they say, oh, you're doing indigenous theology. Right, that's not, it's not the real stuff. That's the stuff at the little table, not the stuff at the big table. And I say, no, 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 I'm doing theology. I, I studied all of the guys, and they are all guys, these old dead white guys. I studied all of them. I know what they said. But, but I don't necessarily agree with some of what they said, because some of what they said has actually been pretty destructive to humanity, so maybe, maybe we'll do some other stuff. But I, I do theology as an indigenous person. When I was doing my PhD, I finished my coursework, and I was in a little gathering of about 40-some people, older people, kind of my age, and, and the woman who had convened the gathering invited all of us at the gathering to introduce ourselves, who we were, where we we're from, and what was one thing that you've finished that you're grateful you've done? And so when it came to me, I was the last to speak, I said, I just wrote my qualifying exams for my PhD. I'm never gonna have to write another test in my life unless I have to redo my driver's license. I'm done! And this dear saint beside me leaned to me and said, now Sonny, is that a real PhD? Interesting, eh? how we think about one another if we don't look like, talk like, walk like, think like, act like me. We're very ethnocentric. All of us struggle with this. The early church pronounced on it as far as it goes in the church. As far as Christian faith goes, there is no singular culture into which we must enter when we come to faith in Jesus. God made you who you are, brought you to this place and is working in your life in this context for a purpose. I don't know it. He does. And I hope you'll find it. But do it as you, not as you trying to be somebody else. Because God made you, you. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you. Thank you for the gift of your spirit. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the gift of the knowledge of the work of your son, his person, his work, his life, his teaching, and his death and resurrection. And for the opportunity that brings us here in these days to learn together, to share together, to grow together, to become more conformed to his image and his likeness. Amen. Thank you all. I'm really excited to be able to speak with you through video. I am a wife, a mother, a victim advocate, an attorney by education, uh, and I was the first woman to file a police report and speak publicly against one of the worst pedophiles in U.S. history. My hope as we come away from today is that you will find uh, comfort and peace as we discuss uh, what is really a very dark issue and find hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was very blessed to grow up in a godly family. I have a younger brother and a younger sister. Uh, who all still I am very close to. Uh, and I enjoyed uh, a lot of different sports and music activities, uh, but in particular the sport of gymnastics, starting when I was about 11 years old. Uh, I loved the sport because it demanded perfection. You could take something very, very difficult to make it look beautiful. I loved what it required out of me. I am a mom. God was very gracious to bless me with an incredible husband. We have three wonderful children and almost four. Uh, my oldest is six and he might be an attorney too because he's just like me. He knows exactly what he wants and he's very good at presenting a reasoned and well-argued case to get it. <laughs> my four-year-old is uh, kind of a Shirley Temple look-alike. She has very dangerous curls and very dangerous blue eyes. And I call her my fire and ice princess because everything is either wonderful or terrible and there is really no middle ground. She's the tomboy who's decked out in her princess outfit while she's body checking her older brother while they play porch hockey. It's awesome. <laughs> and my two-year-old, uh, who actually just turned three, 
she is my sweet little mother. She is so excited for this new baby to come and she thinks it's hers and that I'm going to be the grandmother. And she's got it all planned out. She's gonna do all the feeding and all the caregiving uh, and she's just gonna let me be the grandma. So it's gonna be really easy from here on out. I am also an attorney by education and have been blessed to be able to use those skills in a variety of ways. Uh, and I teach worldview and I am a victim advocate. God was very gracious to lead me to a law school that prepared me uh, very well for legal practice. But shortly before graduation, um, Jacob and I decided to be married. Uh, and uh, where God was leading him was uh, hopefully back to Canada. And so I knew at that point that most likely I would never, at least for the, you know, for the first uh, while in our marriage, work as a full-time attorney. And so that was something that we really had to, uh, had to pray through. But I was raised uh, really with the belief that wherever God calls you is the most important thing you can be doing whether that's raising children or whether that's arguing in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, and I don't believe that where God leads you is ever wasted. And so I have been able to use my legal education, not just in training my children and supporting my husband through school, uh, but in working from the home, in advocacy, in worldview, in teaching. Nothing God ever does is wasted. I first experienced sexual abuse actually in my childhood church growing up. I was seven years old and there was a pedophile in the church who was targeting me and targeting another little girl. Uh, and through that experience, uh, I not only experienced sexual abuse, but I got an inside look at how the church uh, doesn't handle sexual abuse well. And because my parents couldn't prove that I had been abused, the response of the church was that they were damaging a good man's name. I felt the silence and I felt the coldness and I had no way to, uh, no way to understand it. So at eight years old, I was reeling from abuse that I couldn't describe, that I didn't have the words uh, to, to even explain, and also trying to figure out why we had lost everything. At age eight, I didn't really recognize uh, that I was being abused. I didn't have the words for it. Uh, I told my parents that the man made me very scared. Um, I asked them to start picking me up from Sunday school because he would often come to my Sunday school room uh, and he would follow me around the church, so I would hide in the women's washroom uh, until my parents' Sunday school was out so that I could find them quickly. Uh, and so I felt that something was very wrong. Uh, and that incident with my church and the message that I took away from it uh, really set the stage for being abused again. When I was 15, I was a gymnast at that point, and I had some chronic back pain and chronic wrist pain that other doctors hadn't really been able to treat. And so it was suggested that I go up to uh, Lansing and see the most prominent physician in the gymnastics world. He was uh, the, the team physician for our Olympic team. He was the team physician for one of the most prominent gyms in Michigan. Uh, and he was kind of considered the gold standard. He could do things and fix injuries that nobody else could do or fix. Uh, and since I wasn't getting help elsewhere, my mom and I decided to go up and see him. What I didn't know at that time was that he was a serial pedophile and he had been abusing uh, women and little girls under the guise of medical treatment for almost 10 years. And I became his next victim shortly after my 15th birthday. I was abused by him for almost a year under the guise of medical treatment. But then what you do with that information when you're dealing with a very powerful person who's surrounded by two very powerful institutions, I had no idea where to turn. And I had already absorbed the message very clearly uh, from my first abuse at age seven, that if you can't prove it, you don't speak up because there's nothing you can do. Uh, somebody that I had trusted, again, had betrayed that trust. The institutions that surrounded him, I was convinced uh, had to have had warnings about him before, and I was right. Uh, and they had silenced his previous victims and refused to listen to them. Uh, so it wasn't just my abuser I couldn't trust. I couldn't trust anyone around me. And it really felt like he had used, uh, he had used my trust as a weapon. And so the safest thing to do would be to never trust again. And trying to, trying to wrap my mind around how to protect myself when trust wasn't safe, uh, it affects everything you do. Your relationships, your outlook on the world, your ability to even to relate to God. Because trust is the foundation of your relationship to God too. And all of a sudden trust wasn't safe anymore. Sexual abuse really undermines the very foundation of any kind of human interaction. Usually the abuser is someone that you know, someone that should be safe. Uh, and oftentimes they use not just your trust, but things that should be innocent uh, against you. 
uh, abusers know that, that it creates confusion that keeps the victim silent. It creates confusion in the people who are watching the scenario unfold so that they're afraid to speak up or they think it's impossible that that person could be an abuser. And so ultimately what happens with the victim and what I experienced uh, was that the very foundation for human interaction uh, became impossible because even innocent things I now knew could be used uh, to groom, could be used to violate. Uh, and so there's, there's a constant question in the back of your mind. Am I safe? What am I not seeing? What am I trusting that I shouldn't trust anymore? And when you destroy that ability to trust and that ability to enjoy even simple innocent things, it's destroyed the foundation for relating to everyone, including your savior. I really struggled with my faith, especially after fully beginning to recognize the depth of the abuse that I had experienced. Because my question with God was the same question I had with everyone else. Am I safe? Is he trustworthy? Those concepts of sacrificial love, of care, of being, uh, being a refuge, all of those concepts were weaponized to gain access to me. They were weaponized to violate. And those were the same concepts that I needed to be able to hold to, to be able to trust God, and I couldn't hold to them anymore. I was very angry. And I wanted to know what God thought. Did he think it was my fault? Did he care? Was this a big deal to him? And how do I trust somebody that doesn't think this was a big deal? I think the first step uh, for healing to me was just to come to the realization that whatever I don't understand about God and about God's plan doesn't contradict what I do know. And what I do know is that God is love and that God is safe and that he is trustworthy and that he is just and that he cares about sin, that he will bring redemption and healing. And whatever I don't understand doesn't conflict with those truths. I may not always see how they mesh together. I may not always have the full picture of what he's doing, but what I do know is not in opposition to what I don't know. And then understanding, understanding the concept of God's justice uh, for me was just incredibly important in moving forward. And I think that's an area that Christians really downplay uh, and don't, uh, don't emphasize enough. You know, God is a God of justice because he cares about sin. The gospel and God's justice really is the absolute foundation for forgiveness. I think uh, one of the misunderstandings uh, that I had and that many victims often have when it comes to forgiveness is it feels like forgiveness minimizes uh, what happened to you. That it means it wasn't that bad or that it gives an excuse to minimize what happened. Uh, but in reality, if you understand forgiveness, the exact opposite is true. Forgiveness is only possible because God is a God of justice. Forgiveness is my releasing of my desire for vengeance. And I can do that because there is someone who is so much more trustworthy to bring justice. And it also gives me a beautiful picture of what I have been forgiven and just the grace that has been bestowed upon me. And when I understand what I have been given and the forgiveness I have been extended, it's beautiful but even more to understand how trustworthy God is. While God does promise uh, perfect healing, and that gives incredible hope, we're still living in a fallen world. And just like with a physical injury that heals, uh, there are scars that remain. And so healing does not mean that you become, on this side of earth, unvictimized. It doesn't mean that there are, uh, that there are no scars, that the wounds aren't there. What it does mean is that you have a safe place to take the pain. And there is incredible hope for healing, even on this side of heaven, which is one of the most beautiful things that God has promised. But then there is perfect hope for perfect redemption in the end. And that is where the gospel of Christ shines so brightly. Because I can call what happened to me evil, because it was. Because I know what goodness looks like. I can say what happened to me is worthy of God's wrath, because that is what God says. And I can trust God's perfect holiness and his perfect definition of refuge and trust and security and love because he has defined those concepts for me. And so when I am faced with uh, the darkness and the wounds that still exist and just the incredible depth of evil that is still in our world, what I can do with that is allow it to point me to Christ. I can grieve those wounds. I can grieve that damage. I can grieve the sin because Christ is so beautiful. 
these statistics tell us that between 25 and 40 percent uh, of men and women have experienced sexual abuse. So for those of you who fall into that category, who are survivors, my prayer for you coming out of uh, this session is that you will begin to see the incredible goodness of God, that you will know that what happened to you matters, that God cares, that he will bring justice, that he is a safe place, and that you know that you are able to, to face and to acknowledge and to grieve the incredible damage that was done because the depth of the sin points to the incredible goodness and the beauty of God, that darkness and light exist in opposites and that we don't have to pretend the darkness doesn't exist because the darkness proves the light. For those of you who are walking with someone through abuse, who are maybe not a survivor, but know someone who is, my hope for you is that you will be spurred onward to better understand the dynamics of sexual abuse, to understand the incredible devastation that happens, and to equip yourselves to bring the mercy and the grace of Christ to people who are desperately hurting, to be a safe place to grieve, to be able to tell those around you that what happened to them matters, to acknowledge the evil with them and to grieve the damage with them and to love the hope of Christ that we see in spite of the darkness. For those of you who have been abusers, my prayer for you is that you will feel the full weight of what you have done. And my prayer is that you will experience that weight so that you can experience true repentance, so that you can experience the hope of Christ because nothing is beyond his forgiveness or his reach. Good morning, friends. Uh, it's not like you're the only one with a past. You, you know that, right? I, I know what it's like to be stuck in something that you can't stop doing and that nobody knows about. And you wish you could leave it in the past, but it seems to keep following you into your present and um, you can't stop. I know what that's like. I know what it's like to feel ashamed over something terrible that happened to you, something that you didn't ask for, but it happened anyway. You didn't want it. You didn't deserve it. Sometimes it's not things that we have done or are doing. It's not things that have happened to us, that other, others have done to us. Sometimes it's things that should have been done for us, that were not. I, I know what it's like to grow up and to realize uh, that there are certain things that, that you needed as you were growing up that, that weren't there. 
They never came. And it's, it's like you, the people around you all know something that you don't. I know what that's like. And whatever that was for you, whatever that thing is that you're carrying, the shame, the pain, the, the, the sadness, the grief, whatever that is, that's where some of you are right now. You're there right now. And so you listen to people like me, or you listen to the story of Terry, or you listen to uh, Rachel's story, and you go, man, that's so great for them. Like, I'm so grateful for what God has done in their life, but that could never work for me. I know what that's like. Today we're going to offer you a chance to reflect on what difference Jesus has made in all of this, because we've got some good news for you. Do you believe that Jesus has some good news for you in the midst of this stuff? He does. Some good news. You know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I officiated at the funeral for a friend of mine whose, whose dad had, had passed away. His dad had been sick for quite a while, and his health was declining, and he was in hospital for quite a while, and finally he, he died, but not before he had had a very dramatic sort of conversion experience. He decided he wanted to go home and be with Jesus after running from him for a really long time. He prayed to receive Christ, and two days later, he had passed away. It was a beautiful story, actually, and we had a funeral for him. And I do funerals every once in a while, and some of you have been to funerals. Culturally, a funeral is, an, is, a, is a very interesting and strange situation because in a funeral, you take the body of this person and you put it in a box, and we decorate the room. Or you take the remains of this person and you put them in a jar at the front of the room, and you decorate the room, and people say nice things to support you and encourage you and make you feel better. But it seems to me one of the things about a funeral that's really interesting is you can't come away from a funeral without realizing that someday that's going to be you, right? You, you go to a funeral or a celebration of life or whatever language you want to use for it, and you realize, you know, you just can't go away without realizing someday it's going to be you in the box, someday it's going to be your remains in, in that jar, someday. And one of the central claims of the Christian faith, though, is that that's actually already happened to you. One of the central claims of Christianity is that you died. That you died. Do you believe that? Somebody say, I died. Not, not me, you. Somebody say, I died. The Apostle Paul had a past. He, was, uh, he described himself as a Pharisee of Pharisees. Like he was ready to go pro as a Pharisee. He was, he, there was nobody in his day who was more committed to God's law than Saul of Tarsus. And when Christianity began, when the way started to spread, Saul was the guy who would go and, and hunt down Christians. And a lot of the first Christians lost their lives because Saul went town to town naming the Christians and exposing them and having them imprisoned and sometimes killed. So a lot of people suffered because of Saul, right? I just want you to go there for a minute. A lot of people suffered because of Saul of Tarsus. A lot of, a lot of families and churches and communities were ripped apart. A lot of wives were made widows because of Saul. A lot of children became orphans because of Saul of Tarsus. And if you know his story, of course, he, he has a very dramatic conversion experience on the road to Damascus one day, and he goes on and he becomes an amazing evangelist and writes for us about a third of the New Testament. And in the New Testament, he says some things. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and, and see, the new has come in 2 Corinthians 5. Colossians 2, he says, you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In Romans 6, and Romans 6 is great, it's that, it's that chapter that you skip over on your way to Romans 8, but Romans 6, 
Paul says, you have died. Sorry, he said, chapter 6, he says, uh, we, we know that our old self was crucified with him, with Jesus, so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless, so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin, since a person who has died is freed from sin. A person who has died is free from sin. Then Galatians 2, probably a familiar verse. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but you can finish this one, but Christ who lives in me. So this is all over the place in the New Testament. This is, this is Christianity 101, that you died. And there's a fair objection that can be made. Because somebody could say to Paul, oh, that's real convenient. After all that you've done, how easy, how convenient it is for you to say you died. And you escape uh, punishment or escape consequence. And we should, we should respond to that. We should answer that. Christianity has an answer for that, by the way. Because it would be one thing if Paul were saying, that wasn't me. It would be one thing if Paul were saying, like, I didn't do that. Like, let's not be so judgy. Like, I'm trying to do some good things. Let's, let's put the past in the past and let's go on and, and look at the good things that I'm doing. Okay, let's focus on that stuff. That's not what Christianity says, FYI. Okay. That's not, that's not Christianity. Christianity says that it did happen and that it's been dealt with. It says that the things that you have done and the things that were done to you were put on Jesus. It says that uh, the ways that you were hurt and the ways that you may have hurt other people, those have been put on Jesus. That on the cross, he accepted responsibility for those things as though he did it. When Jesus died, you died. And when Jesus rose, you rose. And that was the beginning of a whole new thing. A whole new way of being. A whole new kingdom where Satan and sin and death are no longer in charge. But Jesus Christ is Lord and he rules. And there's there's nothing cheap or convenient or easy about that. It was costly and it was awful. But we call that good news. We call that the gospel. And that same gospel that Paul preached, that same gospel that Paul preached uh, comes to us. And it says, you died. And you've been raised to new life. And so you are a new creation. You're new. And so that's why Paul can say, I'm new. And if you're in Christ, so are you. You're new. Somebody say, I'm new. You are new. Do you live like somebody who's new? Do you live like it? Some of you, you're, you're getting to that age where your eyes are beginning to open to the things that maybe your parents or your family or your teachers, they didn't give you. And so you look around a room like this, and it's like they all got what they needed. Where were my people for me? Why did I have to lack? Why did I have to go without? They all got what they needed, and all I got now is is FOMO. I got the fear of missing out. That's what I got. The fear of not being enough. You're a grown-up now, but you're not free. Some of you, some of you in this room, you're carrying shame and guilt and regret because you haven't gone more than a day or a couple of days without using pornography. Or some other crutch, something else. Maybe it's food, maybe it's drugs, maybe it's gaming, or or Netflix, or fashion, or social media, whatever it is, whatever that thing is in your life, it has you. And it won't let go. And you hate it, but you love it, which makes you hate it even more. Because life is so hard, and these things feel good. You've been doing it so long. It's like you're living a double life. You don't even know who you'd be without it. You're a slave. You're not free. And some of us in this room, you've been through some things that changed you. And it wasn't fair. You didn't ask for it. You were betrayed. You were violated. You were abused. 
Somebody took something from you that they had no right to take. And, and, and so maybe today you're a prisoner and you blame yourself. Maybe you did it. Maybe it's your fault. Maybe it was because of something that you should have done differently. And so you don't trust anyone. You hold people at arm's length and you're not free to live the life God has called you to live. I, I know what it's like to live in these groups, okay? I promise you, I know what it's like to live in these groups. And the question, though, that we need to ask is, do we want to be free? Jesus asked somebody that before he healed them, you know. Do you want to be, do you want to be healed? Do we want to be free? We have a choice. The gospel comes to us, and, and it gives us a choice to make. We used to not have a choice. It used to be that we were powerless to change our story. We were powerless to overcome these things, powerless to heal. But that person died. And we were raised to new life. We're new. We're changed. So we have a choice. We have a choice of whose voice we're going to listen to in this. We have a choice of, of who we're going to give authority, who's, who we're going to let instruct us in this thing. Because somebody is going to be your authority in this, right? Right? Somebody's going to tell you what's what in the thing that you're carrying. Somebody's going to tell you, and you're going to listen to them. So you've got a choice. Am I going to listen to my past? Am I going to listen to the lies that my past tells me? Am I going to listen to my past when it tells me that the way that it's always been, that's the way it's always going to be? Am I going to listen to uh, our enemy, the adversary, our accuser, Satan, when he tells us about all the things that we can't do right, when he takes all the ways that I've failed and he just throws it up in my faith, face and tells me, that's just who you are, and you will always be that person. We're going to listen to that one. Or are we going to listen to the one who made us? Am I going to listen to the one who made me? Am I going to listen to the one who knows me better than I know myself, the one who chose me and the one who saved me? So yeah, we have a decision to make. We have a decision that we, we have a decision to make. Like was like let's just be honest here. Was what Jesus did for us was it enough or wasn't it? Like did this stuff happen? This stuff that we're singing about, like did this actually happen or 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 not? Like, can God be trusted or can't he? Because, you know, if, if he can't be trusted, let's just be honest for a minute. If God can't be trusted to keep his promises that he's made to us, this is a waste of time. Like, stack the chairs, pack up the instruments, it's time to go home. We've got better things to do if God can't be trusted. But if he can, if God can be trusted with these things, then it's time for you to take that stuff that you've been carrying and to put it down. Isn't it? Isn't it time to take that and put it down? It's time to be free. It's time to be new. Because some of us, you came in feeling like a slave to sin, like you'll never escape this thing. You need to know, you don't have to do that thing, whatever that is. You don't have to do it again. Its power over your life is broken. Is that true? You don't have to. And so the last time you did it can really be the last time. You know why? Because you died. And now you're free. You're free. Somebody say, I'm free. So some of you, you came in carrying shame because of, because of something that was done to you. Shame. And, and, and you feel dirty and just full of regret and you need to know that that's not who you are. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your identity is His. No one else has the right to tell you who you are. No one has the right to take that from you. So you don't need to carry that around. You know why? Because you're a new creation. You're free. Somebody say, I'm free. And some of you came in believing You'll never measure up. You'll never catch up to the other people who have the stuff that you don't. You need to know that whatever, uh, whatever we have in Christ, what we have in Christ is a thousand times greater than anything that even the best parents could have given you. 
So you don't need to be a slave to what anybody didn't give you. You're free because of what Jesus Christ has given you. You're free. Somebody say, I'm free. So listen, we're going to wrap this time up now. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward, uh, to come up and lead us in a couple more songs. But we're gonna, so we're going to sing again. We're going to create a space and a time for you to be with God. And some of you, you got some things to celebrate because God has given you some victory in this, these areas, and you know you're free. You know that you died, and you're new, and you're free, and you gotta, you're gonna, you've got stuff to celebrate. But some of you, you've been carrying these things around a long, long time. And today is an opportunity for you to put that down. So as you check in with God over the course of these next couple of songs, I encourage you, I'm going to challenge you to check in with God and ask, like, God, what's it going to look like for me to trust you with these things? What's it going to look like for me to put the past in the past and lay it down and never pick it back up again? So as we, as we do this, as we sing these couple of songs, just forget about the people that you came in with. This is between you and the Lord. Worship him in sincerity and in authenticity. I'll come back up after these couple of songs, and I'll, I'll close us with a, a time of, of guided prayer. And this is an opportunity for us to make a decision in light of what we've heard. So let's pray. Spirit of God, would you just move among us? I want to thank you, Spirit, for putting in the word what you have, that you've recorded it there, and you haven't allowed it to be lost over the centuries that those promises are just as true for us as they were for the Apostle Paul. That we died, we're new, we're free. We're a new creation. So as we sing, as we worship you, would you reveal to us, would you search us and try us? Would you reveal to us those things that we may need to lay down? We want to be new. We want to be free. In Jesus' name.
Some of you, the Spirit of God is tapping you on the shoulder right now. And he's saying, just put it down. I love you. And what I've got for you is so much better. Just put it down. And you can go out of here different than you were when you came in. So I'm going to invite you to stay standing for a minute if, if this is making sense to you. And if you're ready to make a decision today to put that stuff down, I want you to stay standing. You don't have to. I'm not going to invite you to come to the front here. Uh, I'm just going to invite you to stand, though. If God's Spirit is tapping you on the shoulder and saying, like, let's just be done with this thing. Let's take that guilt. Let's take that shame. Let's take that fear or regret. Let's take that lust. Let's take that thing that you've been carrying, and we're just going to put it down. We're going to lay it down. And we're not going to pick it back up again. That, that shame over the thing that was done to you, that thing that you've been carrying around, it doesn't have to define you. You can put it down and never pick it back up. Your, uh, your sin, your regret over the thing you've been doing that nobody else knows about, you can leave it here, seriously. You can leave it here in this room and walk out and never do that thing again. You can take that fear You can take that envy and jealousy of everybody else around you. You can leave that here because what you have in Jesus is better. And there's another group of people. There might be some people in here. I got no doubt that in a room this size, there are people for whom Christianity has been your mask. And you know how to talk the talk and you you know how to play the role. Today's your chance to make a decision to take off that mask and put it down and to receive Christ. To say, Jesus, I'm done. I'm done pretending. I'm done running from your spirit. I'm done doing this on my own. I'm going to receive your sacrifice for my sin instead of trying to work it off myself. I'm going to invite you to be my Lord. I'm going to invite you to live your life through me. And today, I want you to make that decision if you haven't. If God's bringing you to that, if the Spirit is, is, is bringing you to that, this is your time. If that's you, stay standing, and, and I'm just going to pray for us now. God, would you cause us to be, be a people who can say with the Apostle Paul, it's not that I have already reached the goal, it's not that I'm already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ. He said, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, and this is my dream for us, this is my prayer for us, forgetting what is behind, forgetting what's behind, reaching forward to what's ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. God, we are standing because we don't want to go home the same as we were when we came in. We don't want to leave this room the same way we were when we came in. We don't want to carry that stuff anymore. We're done. We want to put it down. We want to be new. You've promised that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And so we take that stuff we've been carrying and we put it down. And Lord, help us never to pick it back up again. We take off our masks. We take it all. Take the shame, the blame, the, the, the grief, that anger, the fear. We lay it down. God, would you let today be the beginning of something new for all of us? We pray this for your glory and for our joy in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. If you would like to be prayed for, personally or in a small group, uh, I and some volunteers are going to be up at the front when we wrap up here. And we'll invite you to come and join us just for some personal private prayer. Thanks, everybody. Peace. As we wrap up this morning, there's just a few things that Sam and I want to share. Um, 
as Sam and I wrap up, there's just a few things that we want to share with you. And, and the first is actually, if we can just thank all of the speakers for sharing their hearts and their experiences with us. It takes a lot of bravery and vulnerability for them to open up like that, and I'm so thankful for how they have and for how they've invited us into that. Um, one thing I've been thinking about is how at a conference like this, there's going to be, I think, right around a thousand people who are coming through the doors over the course of the week, and that means that there's going to be a thousand different experiences of what this conference is like for people. No two people will, will have things land on them in just the same way. And so I know that there's going to be some people here this morning who have had uh, a strong emotional response to, to one or more things that were talked about this morning. Um, and so we want to encourage you to bring that to God and bring that to community. If there are safe people around you, um, bring, that, bring that to other people and, and lay that at the feet of Jesus. And, and if you're someone who hasn't had a strong emotional response, that's okay too. The Lord is working in all of our lives and stories in different ways. And, um, and if that is you... I would also encourage you to look around for who might need a friend, um, who, might, who might need some help, who might need someone to pray with them, just to listen, just to sit with them in something. Um, that's something that, that some of us can be, can be there to offer this week for people who, who really need that. So we can, we're all part of the same community this weekend, um, so I'd encourage you to open up your heart and your life one way or another to the people around you. Mm -hmm. We've died, we're new, and we're free. What a good promise that we have. Immediately after following this session, <coughs> at the front, like Mike said, uh, there will be volunteers with a prayer button uh, who are available if any one of you would like someone to pray with, someone to listen, someone to even maybe sit quietly with. Um, and they're all staff that we've uh, talked to or vetted. And so uh, after session, you can come to the front. Throughout the course of the day and the rest of the conference, you can continue to find these volunteers. They'll be wearing a white button that says prayer. And also, if you're looking for a place where you can find those people or to pray on your own or with friends, uh, Sheraton, Sheraton East uh, is available throughout the conference as a prayer space. Uh, so take advantage of this opportunity to journey, uh, to bring these things to God and to community. Uh, there are a ton of workshops this afternoon. We'll see you after lunch.